Professor Davis' many scholarly work include Arbitrary Justice, The Power of the American Prosecutor, and Policing the Black Man, Arrest, Prosecution, and Imprisonment, which was published in 2017. Professor Davis received the Washington College of Law's Pauline Rowley Moore Award for Scholarly Contribution in the area of public law in 2000 and 2009. The American University Faculty Award for Outstanding Teaching in a full-time appointment in 2002. The American University Faculty Award for Outstanding Scholarship in, 20, in 2009. And the American University Scholar Teacher of the Year Award in 2015. She is a graduate of Howard University and Harvard, and Harvard Law School. It goes without saying that those students who've had the great fortune of having Professor Davis as their professor, I've only heard incredible things about her classes, but more than anything else, in the time that I've been able to spend with Professor Davis, I have been in awe of her br brilliance and her compassion and her passion for this work. And so without further ado, we're going to get started with our conversation. And our conversation is gonna be in two parts. Professor Davis is going to provide some context for her book and the work that led her to, to this book. And then we're going to jump into discussion with our audience, I'm sure many of our audience are waiting to be able to ask some relevant and critical questions. And so, Professor Davis, please get us started. And thanks again for being with us this afternoon. Thank you, Fanta. I first want to start by thanking Dr. A ah for having me today, inviting me to address you on Juneteenth, a special day. Um, I'm honored um, to be here and also really want to thank all of you taking the time this afternoon to join us. Um, Policing the Black Man, Arrest, Prosecution, and Imprisonment is a collection of essays about the many ways that the criminal system polices Black men in the broad sense of the word, from arrest all the way through sentencing. So when I was approached and asked to edit this collection of essays that would explore and contextualize all of these issues, including the horrible police killings of, of unarmed black men, I seized the opportunity because there's no issue more important to me than the unjust treatment of black and brown people in our criminal legal system at every step of the process from arrest through sentencing. Indeed, it's the issue that keeps me up at night. So when I started this project, I thought about who I would ask to join me and so I decided to reach out to the authors, scholars, lawyers, activists, uh, advocates who've been out here for years writing about, litigating, thinking about, teaching, and in many instances living these issues. And I was really very fortunate that so many of them said yes. So from the initial essay of the book, written by Brian Stevenson, the director of the Equal Justice Institute, in which he discusses the history of racial inequity in this country, to the chapter written by Sherilyn Eiffel, the director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, which is entitled, Do Black Lives Matter to the Courts? And in fact, all of the chapters in between, um, the contributing authors are the ones who really made this book. So I do want to start by taking this opportunity to thank all of them, not just Brian and Sherilyn, but Mark Maurer, Kristen Henning, Renee Hutchins, Catherine Russell Brown, Tracy Mears, Roger Fairfax, Ron Wright, and Jeremy Travis, all amazing lawyers, uh, scholars, and authors. This book was published three years ago. In fact, um, July 11th will be the exact publication date. And sadly, here we are today. I, I never thought that these killings would stop after the book was written frankly, but I also never imagined that things would not only get better, but they appear to be getting worse. And yet, I think there's reason to believe that change might finally be on the horizon. So I hope that we'll get to that point of talking about that in today's discussion. But I'm going to spend my time talking about my own chapter, my own contribution to the book, which is about the prosecution of black men and the role of prosecutors and also tied in with all of the unfortunate incidents that are going on around us today. So why do I talk about prosecutors all the time? People want to know. I talk about them because they control our criminal legal system. 
right? They have so much power and so much discretion. And they have used that power and discretion in ways that in my view have contributed to many of the problems in our criminal justice system, namely the crisis of mass incarceration and the unwarranted racial disparities in our criminal justice system. They're, they're not the only cause, but they have contributed to it mightily. Um, so I think we need to pay more attention to prosecutors. A lot of people focus on police officers as well we should, obviously, we see that from what's been going on throughout our history and certainly highlighted in the past month or two. And we should be focusing on cops because they have a lot of power too. They have a lot of power and discretion on the street to stop and frisk and search people and, and arrest people. And they use that power and discretion in ways that uh, unfortunately sometimes lead to the horrific incidents uh, that have happened in the past few weeks and throughout our history. So yes, we must focus on police officers, but we must equally focus on prosecutors. And let me tell you why. Prosecutors, uh, police officers, I should say, have the power to arrest a person, but they can only bring that person to the courthouse door. It is the prosecutor who decides whether the person stays in that criminal legal system, whether they will be charged with a crime and what that crime will be. And they have total discretion in making that decision. So if a police officer brings a, an individual to the court and says, this person you know, committed this offense, the prosecutor can charge that person with the, the charge that's recommended, can charge them with a higher offense, a lower offense, or the prosecutor can say, you know what, I'll just give this person a break and I won't charge them at all. And so you can see how that tremendous power and discretion um, can give them so much control over the system. And let's be clear, it's very, very easy for prosecutors to bring charges. You wouldn't know that in looking at these cases involving these police officers, you wouldn't know that. But in fact, it's incredibly easy for prosecutors to bring charges and they charge a lot. The standard for charging is very low. It's something called probable cause, more probable than not. It's one of the lowest standards in our criminal legal system. And so it's easy for them to bring charges and the probable cause standard is much lower, obviously, than the proof beyond a reasonable doubt that prosecutors need to convict a person. So that often results in them piling on charges, right? And it gives them an advantage when it comes to the plea bargaining stage. People, you all probably have heard of plea bargaining. 95 to 98% of all criminal cases in our legal system are resolved by way of a guilty plea. Prosecutors pile on charges because all they need is probable cause, and so people feel pressured to plead guilty to one offense or two on the prosecutor's promise to dismiss the rest of them because if they decide to go to trial and they're convicted of all of the charges, they could go to prison for a very long time. So there's the kind of pressure that goes on in our criminal justice system every day and prosecutors control all of that. They control charging and they control plea bargaining. And so you can see when there's this much discretion, there is the potential for disparities. And not only is there the potential for it, there are tremendous racial disparities in our criminal justice system. Black and brown people are treated much worse than their similarly situated white counterparts at every step of the process from arrest through sentencing. Much research documents that. And so if a prosecutor, for example, decides, I'm gonna give this person a break. Yeah, they were caught with all this, these drugs, but they come from a good family and they remind me of myself. I did a few drugs when I was growing up. I don't wanna ruin this person's life. They're college bound. I'm gonna dismiss this case against this person. First offender, I'll dismiss this case. Another individual, same charge, same lack of, back, lack of a criminal record, et cetera, might not be bound for college, might not have the same opportunities. And they, they don't really empathize with that person so much, so they end up charging that person. So you've got two similarly situated people who've allegedly committed the same act. One gets a break and one doesn't. And those decisions often break down along class and race lines. That's how we end up, one of the reasons why we end up with all these awful racial disparities in our criminal justice system. And so that's why I focus on prosecutors because they play a huge role. 
Just as they have the power, the power and discretion that they have has resulted in these disparities, they can also use that same power to do good. And I'm going to talk about that a little later on. But that charging power is so critical. And they mostly overcharge. That's why we have so many people in the system being charged with petty offenses. They mostly overcharge, charging when they shouldn't have to, except when it comes to police officers. Right? When it comes to police officers, the script is flipped. Prosecutors rarely charge police officers when they engage in brutality and even when they kill black and brown bodies. Even not when they have not just probable cause, but even when they have overwhelming evidence of guilt. So for example, we all saw little 12-year-old Tamir Rice playing in a park with a toy gun, and we saw with our own eyes those police officers shoot him and kill him, right? Overwhelming evidence, videotaped evidence. Yet that police officer was never charged with killing Tamir Rice. We saw that painful video of Eric Garner on Staten Island being choked to death by that police officer, right? Who stopped him for selling loose cigarettes, not, not raping somebody, murdering somebody, selling loose cigarettes, yet he choked him to death. And we saw that with our own eyes. That police officer was never charged. And even when police officers are charged, they're rarely convicted. So we saw the videotape of Terrence Crutcher in Tulsa, Ohio, on that highway, hands up in the air, a videotape from a helicopter and a videotape from, you know, from, from land level as well, with his hands up in the air, and we saw that police officer murder him, yet she was found not guilty. We saw Philando Cruz in his car with his girlfriend and his little, and his child, right, who had a gun, but he was carrying it legally, and his hands were back, and he said, officer, I'm just letting you know, I, I'm, I have a license. Police officer killed him just like that, and we saw that with our own eyes, yet he was found not guilty. And here we are today. So Ahmaud Arbery was hunted down like an animal and killed on February 23rd, yet no charges were brought until May 7th. Why? Because the videotape came out. It emerged and we learned that the first prosecutor who heard about that awful killing, which was really a lynching in my view, looked at it and said it was justifiable and didn't charge. And then a second prosecutor came in, but it turns out that prosecutor was friends with the people who did the killing. And then a third, now we have, I think, the fourth prosecutor in that case. The charges weren't brought until the pressure was there. Breonna Taylor, a 26-year-old woman, a hero, first, first responder, was killed on March the 13th, laying in her bed, shot eight times. And still, charges have not been brought in that case. And then there was George Floyd. And we watched for an excruciating eight minutes and 46 seconds while this police officer deliberately just squeezed the life out of him with his knee on his neck as he begged for life, saying, I can't breathe, as he called on his dead mother. As people around begged this police officer to stop, you're killing him. And that officer not only continued to do it, he looked right in the video camera. He knew he was being videotaped. And he looked right into that cell phone camera as if to say, go ahead, you know, film me. And he kept, kept murdering this man. Um, that happened on May 25th. Charges were not brought against that police officer until May 29th, but that was only if, after people protested and burned. They burned the, they actually burned the police station down in Minneapolis. And it wasn't until that happened that charges were finally brought. And the initial charges were very weak, brought by the local prosecutor. It, it wasn't until uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison came in and brought murder charges against him and his accomplices. Um, and that happened on June 3rd. Amazingly, uh, despite all the protests that happened, and, and so many protests happened all over the world, right? All people of all races, of all ages, of all, all over the country, all over the world began to protest. 
and people started to think, you know, things are changing, but the killings are still happening. Even after all of that, the killings continue. A number of protesters were killed. Police officers kept killing, right? Even after that. And this latest case of Rayshard Brooks, a man who was not attacking anybody or committing some violent crime when the police officers approached him, he was asleep in a fast food line, failed a sobriety test. Somehow he ended up being murdered by a police officer. And he now finally has been charged by the Fulton County DA. So here's the question, why does this keep happening? Why the video camera, everything. I mean, first of all, it's been happening since the time of slavery, since we were brought to these shores, right? Black people have been killed by law enforcement people who have taken the law in their own hands, right? Unarmed Black people. And it has continued from slavery to the Black hoes through the period of lynching, which apparently is still going on, through Jim Crow. Emmett Till seemed like a moment in history. It's continued. And so many cases that we don't know about because police officers would kill people and even when it was reported nothing happened and police officers would lie and say, you know, the person was attacking me or whatever. So now the only thing that has changed is we've got cell phone cameras and we've got social media. So now we know because we're seeing it with our own eyes. And yet, and yet, even with the cell phone cameras, it keeps happening. And so the question is why? Well, I think there are a lot of reasons why it keeps happening. Uh, I, I wanna talk about a few. One, you know, racial prejudice, racial bias, racial animus. These police officers don't see the humanity in black and brown bodies, right? And so they kill, right? And so that's a huge problem is the racial animus that these officers have, that we all, you know, frankly, I'm not saying police officers are the only ones who have it. You know, there's something called implicit bias, which we can talk about, these unconscious views that all of us have that cause us to view people differently because of their race or their ethnicity, skin color, body type, body size, uh, sexual orientation, I could go on and on, gender. We all suffer from it, but when the person who is, is suffering from it acts on it and they are in a position of power carrying a gun, it has a whole different consequence. So there's, there's racism, that's number one. Number two, police officers are trained to use violence. That's what they're trained to do. The Supreme Court in a case called Terry versus Ohio said even when police officers stop a person on the street and frisk them, they can use force to do that. And certainly they can use force to arrest. So when police officers arrest people, whether they're arresting them for uh, you know, shoplifting or murder, they grab them, they handcuff them, they throw them down. They have the power to do that. They are permitted to do that. So they are trained to use force and violence to deal with everything. And that's one of the reasons why we need to dismantle the entire police function and start from scratch. And that's something that I'd like to talk about um, later on. We need to change the police function. It is one that is based on violence and force, no matter what the circumstance. And another reason is the law, right? The Supreme Court, unfortunately, has set a very low standard for when police officers can use deadly force, right? As long as there's a very loose sort of reasonableness standard, as long as it's it's reasonable for them to believe that they are or the public is in danger. They can use force, even if, they're, even if there's no imminent threat, even if the person's unarmed. That's what the Supreme Court says is constitutional. And I tell people this all the time. Just because something's constitutional doesn't make it right. And just because something is constitutional doesn't mean that local police departments can't set, set their own much higher standard for the use of force. And they should. And some police departments have done that. But, but the constitutional standard is a low one. But then the last reason I wanna talk about is uh, why cops keep doing this is because they're not held accountable. They're not held accountable. They know they're not gonna be charged, right? So that's where the prosecutor comes in. They know that they're likely not to be charged, right? And even if they are charged, nothing's gonna happen to them. So they keep doing it over and over again. So I think it's a combination of all of these things. We need to hold prosecutors accountable. Why are they overcharging black and brown and poor people on the scantest of evidence 
while almost never charging police officers when the evidence is overwhelming. Why are they doing that? Because I said before, they have total discretion. Well, there are a number of reasons. First of all, prosecutors have a very cozy relationship with cops. They work with cops. They're part of the same team. They rely on cops to make their cases, to be their witnesses, to investigate their cases. And so there's a conflict of interest here, right? Cops make contributions, police unions make contributions to prosecutors' campaigns. So I will close by saying we need to hold prosecutors accountable. The vast majority of them are elected officials. They're federal prosecutors and state prosecutors. Most of what goes on in the criminal legal system happens on the state and local level. 90% of all cases are state and local. And in four, all, in all but four states in the District of Columbia, the chief prosecutor is an elected official who runs for office every four years. Usually they run unopposed. People don't pay attention to those races. That is starting to change, but it needs to change more. We need to pay attention to district attorney races and hold them accountable at the ballot box. We need to vote out prosecutors who are unnecessarily prosecuting black and brown people and poor people while allowing cops to get away with murder. So the bottom line, folks, is this democracy, right? We, it's, it's, it's feeling very broken right now, but it's what we have. And change won't happen unless we demand it. So protest, write letters, call your elected officials, send emails, litigate if you're a lawyer, do what you can, and most importantly, vote. So I'll stop there and take any questions that you might have. Thank you, uh, Professor Davis, thank you. Um, for our audience, please use the uh, Q&A chat box um, so that I can, uh, in many ways, channel your questions to Professor Davis. To get us started, um, you know, I haven't had a chance to go over your book and the, and the chapters. I keep coming back to this fundamental question, and that has to do um, with the way I think we have been socialized and how we think about it, in particular Black boys and, and men in our society. And you've talked about the policing of, of sort of Black bodies, which is not new, it's, it's gone on historically and, and it continues um, to be the case. What I'm particularly interested in is also hearing from you because I think some of the authors in your chapter talked about this. What is the impact of this, of the interaction of black boys with the police? So yes, there is a chapter in the book written by Kristen Henning, who is in my view, one of the, if not the most foremost expert on the policing of black boys and juveniles in general in the system. And her chapter in the book is really amazing. And I think we get more questions about that one than anyone. And she's spoken on panels with me before. It's called Boys to Men, The Role of Policing and the Socialization of Black Boys. And she has a book coming out uh, about that issue. And really what the evidence shows is that black boys are actually policed more than any other group, more than black men, more than black women, more than girls. Black boys, when police officers see black boys on the corner doing what boys do, what kids do, playing around, whatever, their instinct is to go over to them, ask them what they're doing, throw them down, frisk them, handle them. And of course, kids, the, the juvenile brain is different from the adult brain. They're going to react like kids react. An adult would react to that, but certainly kids do, right? And so then it creates a conflict between the two, and the next thing you know, they are arrested. And so there, as far as how black children and particularly black boys are treated in the system, it's even worse. And the racial disparities are even worse. And that chapter in the book outlines, outlines that problem and, and also presents some situations for reform. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna take some of the questions. Um, can you talk about, you know, sort of dismantling the police, which certainly will resonate with many I believe um, on this, you know, um, in, in this in this program, talk a little bit more about that. There's been a lot of conversation about defunding the police. There's been a lot of conversations uh, about dismantling the police. What what does that really mean? Sure. So the defund the police movement, I think, is an important one. I don't like the title of it because when people hear, when some people hear the term defund the police they immediately think that what they mean is we're not gonna have any more police and if something happens to me and I'm being harmed, I can't call 911, that's not what it means. 
Basically what the defund the police movement is saying is that we need to stop putting the millions and millions and on the federal level, billions of dollars into police departments who are using uh, the funds that they receive to hire more police, to buy more equipment, to buy military equipment, and to police neighborhoods when they oftentimes don't need to. And to divert, divert, excuse me, to divert some of that funding into social services agencies that deal with the problems that often bring people to the police. So we have people calling the police when someone is having a substance abuse problem or when someone is, is you know, drunk in their car, right? Like, like Ms. Poor Mr. Brooks or is having a mental health episode. And police officers are not trained to handle those problems. Those people don't need the criminal legal system. They do not. They need help. And so police officers go to them and they do what they're trained to do. Grab them, arrest them, throw them down, and then oftentimes we end up with the tragedies that we've been witnessing in the past few weeks. And so that needs to stop. We need to have a police department that focuses we, we do need police to deal with the serious violent crimes. We can't call a social worker if somebody's being killed. Maybe we can to help somebody, but we need the police for violent offenses. We need them focusing on that and all of this funding that's being used to have them police people on issues that they don't need policing on should be given to individuals, social services agencies, et cetera, who know how to handle it. And actually it's starting to happen, Albuquerque, just recently started an alternative safety department that is comprised entirely of unarmed social workers, violence prevention experts, uh, mental health experts, et cetera, who are trained to deal with those issues. You know, I think about poor Mr. Brooks sitting in his car drunk. Imagine if that police officer, when he was called by the people at the Burger King or whatever that place was, imagine if the police officer had gone over to the car woke him up, you know, okay, give him the sobriety test. Okay, you're drunk, Mr. Brooks. What's your phone number? I'm gonna call your family. I'm gonna have them come get you and take you home to sleep it off. What's wrong with that? You know, even if he was technically, you know, com had committed a DUI, do we really have to arrest him, right? And so the reality is that cops do that with a lot of people. I guarantee you that Mr. Brooks had been white, that's what they would have done. They would have said, hey man, Buddy, wake up. What's your wife's name? You know, and they do that all the time. They resolve all kinds of issues short of arrest, right? But back to your point, that's what the defund the police movement is about. I think it's an important movement. We do need to dismantle it. We do need to divert funds. And we also, even for the police that are going to remain, we need to train them differently. Train them that they don't yet have to use force all the time. That they can train them in de-escalation techniques, train them not to use violence, and train them only to use deadly force when it is absolutely necessary. And so I think all of that needs to happen in order for us to have a, a better police department, if you will. So there's some reforms. There's, there's a lot of talk about police reforms, and there are lots of bills that are going through Congress. Um, and, you know, do you, first of all, do you think those, do you think those bills really are, are covering the core issue? And two, do you think actually that is, it is going to make a difference? Um, and if you had to change some of the, 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 the components of the bills that are being put forward, what would, what, would, what would those be and why? Well, there's a lot of different bills going on. First of all, that executive order that the person in the White House signed was nothing. It was, it, it was if you read it carefully, it was, all it did was let's encourage the police officers to do this and we'll incentivize them. Maybe they can do this. It, there was no requirement for police officers to do anything, so it was nothing. But the bill that's being put forth um, by the Democrats in the House and the Senate does have some important parts to it. They want to get rid of qualified immunity, which is this doctrine that makes it really difficult to sue police officers, almost impossible to sue them. Um, it, it has um, a, a ban of chokeholds. There's a lot of important pieces, but what is missing from it is what I just talked about, which is a restructuring of the whole police function. What they need to do, because Congress in the past has put billions, and I mean billions with a B of dollars through a program called the COPS program, the Community Oriented Policing, I forget the, what the S stands for. 
And they have literally put billions of dollars into police departments across the country. And that's under both Democrat and Republican administration. What they need to do is divert some of that money into social services or incentivize police officers. You will get funding if you train your officers on de-escalation policies, right? And so I think that's what really needs to be done. But the bottom line is that what Congress has done doing does not stop local uh, police departments and local entities, states, and cities and counties from doing their own thing. So for example, Los Angeles, in Los Angeles, the city council the other day voted to move 100 to $150 million from their police budget into social services. So we really need this to happen on the local level because that is really, it's local police departments where most of this is going on. And so what's going on in Congress is fine, but it's not enough. And it certainly doesn't stop local entities from making changes. And I don't like that word reform. The word reform, we've been using it for years. We need fundamental change. We don't need to reform the police function. We need to dismantle it and reimagine it. So we've talked about, you know, arrest and all of that, but I think also the other thing we need, and you, you've talked about, you know, the defunding and the dismantling of, frankly, the police as an institution and the reimagining of it um, with, with sort of different functions. I think the other challenge that we have is mass incarceration. And it goes with that saying, when you look at the statistics, of you know who is being incarcerated and at what rate and the impact of that on communities is is staggering um so talk to us a little bit about also the institution of mass incarceration and mm -hmm. there's been a lot of conversation about how do we abolish that understanding that this has been very much part of the dna of our institutions in this country yeah so we're at a crisis point, I think, in, in this country, right? Um, we have 2.2, we have almost 7 million people under the control of the criminal legal system, meaning in prison, parole, on probation, on parole, um, or in, I'm sorry, in prisons and jails on both the federal and state level and on probation and parole. We have 2.2 million people in our prisons and jails. We have the highest incarceration rate in the world. We have extraordinary racial disparities. Uh, black and brown people, as I mentioned before, are treated much worse uh, than their similarly situated white counterparts. And so it is a huge problem. And there, it's, there are a lot of complex reasons why it happens. And so there, there's going to have to be varied and complex solutions for it as well. And I think that's, why, that's one of the reasons why I focus so much on prosecutors. For, there are laws. We have sentencing laws that are just horrible. We have the, some of the longest sentences in the world. If you look at some European countries in Norway, Denmark, and others, the most time an individual can get, even for murder, is 21 years. But here in this country is life without parole, and we have the death penalty. We're one of the few countries in, in the Western world that still have, we're the only one in the Western world that has the death penalty, right? And so we're so behind and so barbaric when it comes to how we treat people in this country. We have life sentences that give life without parole, meaning you will spend the rest of your life in a cage for nonviolent offenses. You can get life without parole for certain drug offenses in the federal system, especially if you're a repeat offender. This is, you haven't touched another person, you haven't harmed anybody. Life without parole. And so we have this punitive attitude in this country of you know, dealing with problems by locking people up. Of course, we don't do that with everybody, right? We don't do that with everybody. We do it with poor people and we do it with black and brown people, right? And so what I say is that there are ways of holding people accountable without putting them in a cage. I'll say that again. There are ways of holding people accountable without putting them in a cage, right? You can have people pay back something that they've stolen. We don't, why do we have to treat people like animals? And that's the mindset in this country. So that needs to change on a fundamental level at every single level. I talked about dismantling the police function. The prosecutors, they're the ones, as I said before, who make the decisions to charge people in the first place. Just because there's, there are laws on the books does not mean that prosecutors have to implement them. In fact, a lot of times they don't, as I said before. Some people they don't charge, some they do. So prosecutors could play a huge role in changing this horrible problem we have and in making a dent 
on the mass incarceration problem. And some have started to do it. There are, I'd say about a couple of dozen of new, what people call progressive prosecutors who have been elected in various jurisdictions around the country who ran on a platform of ending mass incarceration and ending racial disparities. Unheard of in the history of prosecutors. Yet Kim Fox in Cook County ran on that model. Rachel Rollins in Suffolk County is the chief prosecutor there ran on that model. Larry Krasner in Philadelphia ran on that model and they won their elections and they are in fact diverting cases out of the system, refusing to charge a lot of petty offenses and they're going after cops who are abusing their power. And so we need to elect more prosecutors like that too. And we also, and I have to say as a former public defender, you know, to make our system better, we need to fund our public defender offices around the country. Public defenders play a critical role in this criminal legal system in protecting their clients and providing the best defense possible for their clients. And so we need to make sure that just as we are voting out bad prosecutors that we support public defenders as well. So, you know, when it comes to prosecutors, this is really more at our, at our local level. I think for a lot of times we tend to be focused on the federal system as opposed to thinking at the local level, right? Um, to help our audience understand a little bit more because I think for the audience that would be here, you can imagine these are students who are deeply passionate about these issues um, and want to see change and have the ability to enact change. Talk to us a little bit about how does one do that at a local level? What does it take to do this at a local level? Because a lot of the questions that are coming up are about prosecutors, about the transparency of how, for example, they get elected, where is the funding coming from, and how do they kind of get themselves more involved? Um, how can our students and others get involved at a local level in these issues? Okay, boy, that's about five or six questions. <laughs> so I'll, I'll do my best to tackle them one by one. So as I mentioned before, we have a federal system and we have a state and local system. And federal prosecutors are appointed in these various districts. We don't vote for them. There's even less accountability there. But only about 10% of all criminal cases are handled on the federal level. Most are handled on the state and local level. And prosecutors are elected officials. You have states, they are called, sometimes they're called district attorneys, sometimes they're called common, in Virginia, they're called the Commonwealth, Commonwealth attorney. Uh, in Maryland, they're called state's attorneys. Some places they're called prosecuting attorneys, but they're the chief prosecutor, they're elected. And the way people can get involved is by holding them accountable, not just at the time of elections, but ask for a meeting with your local prosecutor. You know, I was talking to a relative the other day who lives in Louisville, and she's very upset about the fact that no, the officers who killed Breonna Taylor hasn't been charged. She's like, what can I do? I was like, you need get together. If there's a local group, NAACP, whatever group, demand a meeting with the local prosecutor and ask him why these charges haven't been brought. I understand there they've deferred it to the attorney general, but the point is that we have to be vocal. You know, and it, there's ways of doing it. There are organizations out there that you can join. You know, if you don't want to do this by yourself, join, make your own organization and go to these people and demand that they be responsible to you because they serve you, the people. So there are a lot of things that people can do and everybody can't do everything. There are people protesting in the street and that's so important. The Black Lives Matter movement so important. We wouldn't be where we are today without the founders of that movement and people who participated in that movement. Critical. We have to be out there, you know, protesting and demanding, right, what we want. But we also have to be doing things in other ways. We have to, you know, call our uh, elected officials, email them, write to them, demand meetings, talk to them, demand accountability, right, in a variety of ways. Uh, there are lawyers out there who are litigating. They're, there's, you know, use what everybody, as I tell people, everybody can't do everything, but everybody can do something, can pick one thing to do. And I, accountability, I think. And I'm hearing from you that, you know, the focus, you know, has been on the police and, and the need and, and the major reform that are needed there from, as an institution, but that there hasn't been as much focus on the prosecutors. And I assume that part of that is because there's not as much of an understanding of the role of prosecutors for the average person. Um, and the question that keeps coming up from our audience really is you've mentioned, um, you know, this piece about uh, the probable cause as being one of those standards. Uh, you've talked about plea bargaining and what happens with plea bargaining and so forth. 
it seem, it sounds from, from the questions that I'm getting from our audience, are you suggesting that we need to reform those as well? Yes, we do. So just to give an example of how this whole plea bargaining thing works. So let's say we've got um, an individual who gets arrested by the police with a whole, well, let's use drugs as an example. Let's say he's been caught with, I don't know, six bags of cocaine. And the police officer arrests him, brings the case to the prosecutor, the prosecutor decides. And again, remember, they can decide to throw the case out or they can decide to charge him with the distribution of cocaine or they can decide to charge him with a misdemeanor. Totally up to the prosecutor. They make these decisions behind closed doors. They don't have to justify them to anybody, which is problematic in and of itself. But let's say they decide to charge this individual with five counts of distribution of cocaine. And let's say each one of those counts carries 10 mandatory minimum years in prison, meaning that if they're convicted, they have to serve 10 years because it's required by law, the judge has no discretion, right? So all the discretion is in the hands of the prosecutor. Once they charge this person, right, you can see how that gives them so much power. Well, the prosecutor then has the option of, and it's totally up to the prosecutor, of offering what they call a plea. And let's say this prosecutor says, okay, I'll make you a deal. I'll, let, I'll allow you to plead guilty to one count of distribution of cocaine and I'll dismiss the other four counts, right? And, and so, the person is saying, wait a minute, but I didn't do it. But if they go to trial on all five counts and they're convicted of all five counts, they're looking at 50 years in prison. So you can see how even an innocent person would feel compelled to take the deal. And many do. 95 to 98% of all cases are resolved by way of a guilty plea. And the way this is done, oftentimes there are no real rules around it because prosecutors can do what they want. So I've Many situations where a prosecutor would say, okay, I'll let your client plead guilty to one count of distribution, but he's got to take the plea tomorrow. And the defense attorney might say, well, wait a minute, I have an ethical duty to investigate the case. My client might be innocent. I need time to investigate. And the prosecutor can legally say, too bad, take the deal tomorrow or it's off the table. This happens in courtrooms every day around this country, right? And that's what passes as justice. So yes, we do need to have reforms around that. We need to have more, you know, uh, we need to have enforcement of the rules that are in place. Prosecutors have, for example, a constitutional duty to turn over all exculpatory evidence. So if they have any evidence that would tend to show that the defendant is not guilty, they're required to turn it over. It's something called, they call it Brady material because it's, it's named after a case, Brady versus Maryland. The problem with that case is that the Supreme Court doesn't make it clear and in fact, does not require the prosecutors to turn over that material at any particular time. It's something like in a timely fashion. So prosecutors tend not to turn it over, if at all, until the trial. Well, if there's not going to be a trial, it's never turned over. Wow. But pleading guilty without getting that information, those rules need to change. And then local jurisdictions can change those rules. And some jurisdictions do have what they call open file discovery, where they turn over all this information. But unless you've got, that's why I keep going back to elections, because there's so much power and discretion. If you have a chief prosecutor who believes in open file discovery and who requires his assistant district attorneys to turn over all the information on day one and to not overcharge cases and not to make unreasonable plea offers, then we can have some progress. Like, I, I hate to say it, but I've almost, I, I, when it comes to a lot of these issues, like in the criminal justice field, I've given up almost on the Supreme I won't say almost, I've given up on the Supreme Court because they set such a low standard. I'm focused on now, let's just get some pe decent people in there who believe in justice, who want to change this criminal legal system to, to, to address this crisis that we find ourselves in and have them require these prosecutors to do the right thing. You know, the Supreme Court says it's in, a, in a case uh, called Berger versus United States that it's not the role of the prosecutor to seek convictions. The role of the prosecutor is to seek justice. And sometimes justice may mean seeking a conviction, but a lot of times justice means not seeking a conviction, not charging a person. Because prosecutors don't represent like one person. They don't represent, even if it's a case that has a victim, prosecutors do not represent the victim. They represent the community. They represent everyone. And that includes the victim, the defendant, and the entire community. And they're supposed to make their decisions in the best interest of all. 
And far too many of them don't do that. Far too many of them just see convictions and far too many chief prosecutors are still out there who measure success by the number of convictions that a prosecutor has. Whereas we need more prosecutors who promote people when they, based on the number of cases they divert out of the system, right? That, that's, that's, we need a whole new way of thinking. Mm -hmm. As I said before, fortunately, we do have some of those prosecutors. I mentioned a few, Kim Gardner in St. Louis, Kim Fox in Cook County, Larry Krasner. There are many others, not many others, but you know, I'd say a couple of dozen, and we need more like that. And I do think we could, we could have more fundamental change uh, in our system. So I want to switch back again to policing and the institution of policing. Um, our, our audience really do have some questions about training, but also more importantly, do you believe that measures such as restorative justice could be good alternatives to what we currently have with the system and the approach to how we deal with, with situations? Yes, I do. The restorative justice move is a, a very interesting one where you have the person who's charged with the offense meet with the victim and the victim has to agree with to, to agree to this meeting and talk to the victim about what they really want. What, we, what people don't understand is that victims don't always want blood, right? Victims don't always want the person to go to prison for the rest of their lives. Sometimes they want to just be made whole Sometimes they want an apology from the person who has committed the offense. And there have been some remarkable things that have happened with restorative justice. I will say right here in the District of Columbia, and the District of Columbia is different because we're not a state in the District of Columbia, and so we don't have a district attorney. So the prosecutor in the District of Columbia that prosecutes most criminal cases is the federal prosecutor. It's not like they're anywhere else. But the federal prosecutor in DC, the US attorney for the District of Columbia prosecutes local cases and federal cases. But we do have an elected prosecutor in DC and that's our attorney general. And that's, we have a great one now. His name is Carl Racine, former public defender actually from the DC Public Defender Service. He's now the attorney general. And he's doing some remarkable things because he, most attorney generals deal a lot with consumer protection, a lot of civil issues, but they also, and especially in the District of Columbia, deal with some minor offenses and they deal with juvenile cases. And so that office handles juvenile cases and they're doing extremely you know, wonderful things in terms of diverting cases out and they're doing a lot with restorative justice. And so there are some good models of restorative justice and we do need to, and I think that's important because it's not enough to just divert misdemeanors out of the system. That's not gonna put a dent in our mass incarceration problem. We have to find out a way to deal with violent crimes. And by the way, a lot of crimes that are called violent crimes are not necessarily violent. So for example, if you've got a, a robbery case where you've got a bunch of kids running down the street, one of them grabs somebody's purse, that's a robbery and that's a violent offense when you grab that. But you might have two or three running behind them, you know, cause that's what kids do and they never touch the woman or, you know, they're, and they're called aiders and abettors, but they weren't the people who actually committed the act. Yet if they're convicted, it's a robbery. That's a violent offense, even though there was no violence. So you have to look behind the terminology a lot. And the point I'm making here is we need to be looking more individually at what happens in these cases and not just looking at what the charge is, because so many of these cases don't need to be in the system. There are other ways that they can be resolved. And I do think restorative justice is a good model that's being used successfully in a lot of jurisdictions. So you mentioned, you know, that the difference between now and before is that we have social media, we have cameras that are available, and so we can see it with our own eyes. And so as a result, we're seeing in some cases where there's being arrests made and charges in some of the recent cases. Um, talk to us a little bit about, for some folks, they see that, that that's really where justice, justice has been served, in that you've had the arrest, you've had these charges that have come in and so forth. Um, Talk to us about really, from your perspective, what does justice look like, Professor Davis? What is justice in these instances? In those, in those, okay. In those cases. In those, in the cases where people. Where police, the police have been arrested and they've gone through the system. What should justice look like in, 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 the, in these instances? That's an interesting question. You know, as I listen to, I've been watching, you know, the painfully, a lot of these families who've lost lo loved ones, 
talking about, you know, their loved ones and how they should still be here. And what many of them have said is, you know, yes, we've arrested the police officer and charges have been brought. We don't know if there's going to be a conviction, but maybe there'll even be a conviction. But that's not going to bring their loved one back, right? And so is that really justice, right? We can't go back, right, after that person. We, you, these police officers can get locked up. But that's not going to bring that person's loved one back, nor is that going to that's, nor is that going to stop this from continuing to happen. So for me, justice looks like us dismantling the whole structure that we have now for policing. To me, that would be some semblance of justice because then we would have a situation where we're not having these individuals who are trained and just instinctively use force that sometimes results in the loss of life. So justice to me would be a dismantling of the current police function and building something new where police officers are truly there to protect and serve and not, you know, uh, control and harm people and use force against them, and where we bring in individuals from the community to resolve a lot of incidents. We don't have to resolve everything with the criminal legal system. In fact, I think most, and there are probably very few cases that we really need to, you know, involve the criminal legal system. Obviously, they're very serious and violent crimes that need to be dealt that way. But the vast majority of what's now in our criminal legal system shouldn't even be there. So to me, justice would be a reimagination of this whole system that we have now to make it a more fair system, one that's not based on retribution and harm and, and, and based on profit, which a lot of them are, but one that's based on human dignity and treating all human beings with dignity, right? Brian Stevenson often says, you know, we, we don't want to be measured by the worst thing that we've ever done, right? Because everybody has. And so we, 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 we want to be, we don't want to be judged by our worst day. You know, everybody makes mistakes in their lives and we need to have more humanity, you know, in, in this system and treat people with dignity. To me, that, that would be some semblance of justice. Do you have hope? I do have hope. And, you know, and I probably shouldn't have hope because I turned 64 in two weeks and I'm just tired of seeing this stuff happen over and over again. I tell the story all the time. I grew up in the South, right, where there was white and colored signs. I experienced that. And so it's painful to be here at 64 years old, seeing not just the same thing, but some of the worst racial violence I've ever seen in my life. And so you would think I would be hopeless, but I'm not. Because all of these protests going on around the country, when I look at the faces of these people, when I see you know, people of all races and ages and, you know, from all backgrounds coming together saying that Black lives matter, it does give me hope. People all over the world, like, and I tell the story all the time about this little town in Alabama, Mountain View, I think is the name of it. Mountain View, Alabama has, not, it's 98% white, 1% Black, and they had a Black Lives Matter rally. 400 people showed up. And so when that happens, I have to have hope. I think that the, this is a moment in time when change is possible. And I think we need to seize this moment, you know? And most importantly, vote. Vote in November, everybody. Professor Davis, I agree with that saying that for many of us uh, who are not in the um, legal field. This has been incredibly, incredibly educational on so many levels. Um, what are your last words for our audience? And, and you know, a lot of them are asking, what can we do? And especially for those um, who are not always the voices at the table. Um, it's, it's particularly a lot of the white students and others are asking a lot of these questions. Um, what, what are you, what, what's your last word to our audience? Well, I think I've already said it, but I'll say it again. Everybody can't do everything, but everybody can do something. Find the issue that you care deeply about and work on it. And also educate yourselves. There are all kinds of wonderful reading lists going around about race, about the history of racial injustice in this country. Read books, right? Not just my book. I'm not here pushing my book. 
But there are all kinds of wonderful books out here about racism in the criminal, ju in the criminal justice system and in the country in general. So we need to educate ourselves first and foremost, and then take action on whatever level you can. You know, there are student organizations, there are community organizations that are out here working on these issues. The NAACP, the ACLU is done, doing remarkable work as well. There are all kinds of groups out here that are working on various issues in the criminal legal system from bail all the way through sentencing. And they're all over, the, the students know more about them probably than I do because a lot of that information is out there. Find one thing that you feel passionate about and do it because it's gonna take all of us working together. Um, and as I said before, you know, most importantly, as you're working on these issues, hold, hold your elected officials accountable. You know, my ancestors died so that I could have the right to vote. And so I'm not gonna waste that. And all of us, we may not have the perfect choices, but we sure have choices. And, and they, those choices are there and it makes a difference. So that's what I would say, you know. Hold, hold your officials accountable and make sure you vote in November. Well, my dear friend, it goes without saying um, that it's been an incredible one hour. Thank you. Thank you for your wisdom. Uh, thank you for the insights. And more importantly, thank you for sharing your time um, and your knowledge with so many of us today. I very much appreciate it. And I think for all of our audience that are out there, um, there is a lot of work to be done, a lot of work to be done, um, and we do not have the option to be tired in the work that is so ahead of us. The stakes are high. Um, and so with that, we're going to end our program for today. And again, Professor Davis, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for having me, and thanks to everybody for joining me today. Thank you.